Joining us now, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. He's a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Worth talking to you about this. Joe Biden fended off Donald Trump in the presidential election, uh, some would argue, to save our democracy from Trump's fascism. But Trumpism obviously still exists, and it, it's coursing through the veins of Ron DeSantis, especially as it comes to the issue of Russia. Are you concerned about this? Well, let me make it clear first, um, and thanks for having me, uh, that you can have uh, good faith objections to U.S. support for Ukraine. We should always be willing to have a debate about whether it makes sense or not for the United States to send troops abroad, to support wars overseas. It's not, by definition, unpatriotic to question U.S. military involvement in places outside of the United States. Um, but to Claire's point, this doesn't appear to be a good faith objection. Um, the the Republican Party, in particular the Trump wing of the Republican Party, um, has decided to turn its back on democracy. They have tremendous affection for dictators because they've decided that they would rather um, sacrifice American democracy if that's what's necessary to stay in power. And so I, I worry that DeSantis's and Trump's support for Putin and opposition to Ukraine is part and parcel of a broader lack of enthusiasm uh, for democracy and self-governance. So I'm willing to have the debate about whether it makes sense to you know, send uh, money to Ukraine. Uh, I think it makes a ton of sense because it is just true. If we don't defend Ukraine, the entire post-World War II order falls apart. And it is not hyperbole to suggest that Putin will move on a NATO country, which will definitely put U.S. troops into the fight, that China will move on Taiwan. Uh, all of a sudden, we live in a chaos world. Uh, this is a, frankly, worthwhile and relatively small investment to protect U.S. security and global security in the long run. So, Senator Murphy, let's let's talk about that, the, the war itself at the moment. You sit on the Foreign Relations Committee. There's been real concerns. We talked about them last hour about Ukraine running low on ammunition, that a lot of its best men have been sidelined, injured or killed, uh, and that there may be real trouble for it to launch a counteroffensive this spring, as much anticipated. Where do you think see things stand right now? What are your concerns? I think Ukraine has defied the odds since the first day of this war. Uh, the, the smartest intelligence people in the United States said that Ukraine was going to lie down and that Putin would be uh, in Moscow, with, in Kyiv, within the first few weeks of the war. Um, Ukraine has a fighting spirit that is indomitable. Uh, and the same things that some people are saying about the ability of Ukraine to fight are, are more true about the Russian side. Reports coming that they are you know, starting to ration food supplies applies to the Russian front, uh, an inability to get uh, replacement parts for some of their most critical machinery. They're reputed, the Russians reputed big spring offensive seems to actually be underway and it is making absolutely no progress. They are just losing soldiers by the dozens in daily fighting. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen this summer, but uh, I know that Ukraine uh, has stood up to Russia, defied the odds, and they are likely to do that over the course of the rest of this fighting year. And hopefully that uh, convinces Putin that uh, it's time to sit down and try to bring an end to this conflict. Hey, Chris, Claire. you mentioned um, Chi and, and Taiwan. I'd like to switch our focus for a minute to the Middle East and Chi bringing uh, Saudi together with Iran and what impact that has. Is that him sensing a weakness right now because of the inner turmoil in Israel over Netanyahu uh, getting into bed with the ultra right in terms of what what he's doing to, mo to democracy in Israel and the judiciary? What what is what's going on there? Why is Chi in these pictures and the United States seems to be sidelined right now in the Middle East? Okay, Senator Senator Murphy oh, lost gosh. audio there, so Darn I'll it. jump to yeah, John. Really I wanted to hear his answer. A really good question, uh, but you should wish that question to Mike Barnacle, see what he has to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I can fill in. It's uh, We're still gathering intelligence, so I don't have the entire information. <laughs> but if you'd like to hear about the Red Sox in spring training, Mike has a lot. He's got, a, he's got much more detailed <laughs> reading. Well, it is really interesting it's, what's no, going I mean, on right now. The, I mean, the U.S., the China stepped in to play a role the U.S. usually does. They're exactly. the ones standing there bridging this gap. And this is something the U.S. has been supportive of and that the, the, the publicly taking the high road here. Uh, you admit, Senator Murphy, I think we have it there. I don't know if you, how much you heard of oh, Claire McCaskill's question. Uh, we wanted to ask you about yeah. China's role there in the Middle East. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's a really important topic. Um, uh, listen, there's no doubt that China wants to play a bigger role in the uh, Middle East. Um, and I don't buy the notion uh, that um, China's decision to get more militarily involved in the Middle East is automatically, by definition, bad for the United States. I, I mean, ask yourself, has the United States benefited by being the sole guarantor of security, being so heavily militarily invested in the Middle East over the past 40 years? The fact of the matter is China has been a free rider on U.S. Gulf security, right? All of the oil that matters more to China over the next 50 years than to the United States is guaranteed securitized by billions of dollars in U.S. defense spending. Um, so I don't necessarily think by definition it is bad for the United States if China shares part of the load of securing the flow of oil outside of the Middle East. That all being said, there is no practical viable alternative to a U.S. security partner partnership in the Middle East. So I don't think we have to worry that Saudi Arabia or UAE is going to turn their back on the United States. China still doesn't have the doesn't have the kind of systems that we can supply them. So, you know, to me, um, this is good for the Middle East. It's good for the United States. If Iran and Saudi Arabia are fighting less, maybe it's a little uncomfortable that it was China, not the United States, that brokered that partnership. But in the end, if it makes the Middle East less full of confrontation, then that's good for our interests and Chinese interests. This is not a complete total zero sum game. Not everything is about the United States winning and China losing. Sometimes there are developments that can be good for both of us. Senator, here in the United States, uh, there are a few issues more substantial, more pressing than the fact that it's easier to get a handgun than a library book. Uh, yesterday, the president of the United States signed a few more executive uh, amendments to help reduce uh, the flow of guns and to help identify gun owners. Tell us your familiarity with that. I know your familiarity on the issue. It's affected you both personally and politically. But where are we going here? Are we ever going to <clears throat> see real progress? Well, I mean, let me make the case that we saw real progress last year when we passed the first substantial gun safety measure in 30 years. We broke the back of the gun lobby. The NRA opposed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which passed Congress last summer, and we still were able to get substantial Republican support for it. I think we saw a paradigm shift in 2022. I think the gun safety movement now has more power than the gun lobby does. Maybe the most important piece of that executive action yesterday is um, a move Move to implement a relatively unknown section of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. That act changes the definition of what it means to be a gun dealer, a gun seller, that requires you to be licensed and conduct background checks. There are hundreds, thousands of small-scale gun sellers all across this country who are selling lots of weapons, maybe 10, 20 a year online or at gun shows, who don't get licensed and they don't perform background checks. That's where the flow of illegal guns starts. Biden's executive order says we are going to move forward with a new regulation based upon a change made in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that will tighten up the definition of who needs to be licensed as a firearm dealer. And it will result in thousands of more people getting that license and being required to perform those background checks. That absolutely saved lives. There's a big, uh, there's other parts of that executive order that uh, matter, uh, but that's probably the most most important element of it. So I want to come back to the topic at the top here, which is the, the, the questions about Ukraine, about the about United States support for uh, Ukraine in the, in the war with Russia. Uh, higher $13 billion uh, we've spent so far on economic and military support uh, since last February. There is, you know, Ron DeSantis may be uh, out of his depth in a lot of ways on this topic, but uh, it is the position that Donald Trump uh, is kind of increasingly staked out. The politics of that are pretty clear. And they're in line with a, a, a large and growing part of the Republican base that questions whether the money that's being spent uh, should have, uh, as, as Kevin McCarthy said, you know, no blank check, right? So here's the question I have for you. Mitch McConnell has been a big voice uh, on the Republican side, helping the, the Biden administration maintain bipartisan support. How much is Mitch McConnell's voice missed right now uh, as the Republicans seem to be fracturing over this question? 
Well, I listened to you know the, the the string of clips of Republican senators objecting to Ron DeSantis's position, and that yeah. suggests that there are you know plenty of uh, high-profile Republicans in Congress who are willing to stand up to this really disturbing anti-Ukraine trend in the Republican Party. So I, I'm proud of my Republican colleagues that are not backing down and making clear uh, that you know this is a pretty worthwhile investment for the American people, and I think the American people agree. It is true that there are more Republicans than before who are following Trump's lead. But by and large, there's still a sizable majority of the American public who, frankly, you know, look at Ukraine fighting day after day, giving up their lives to defend their democracy um, and 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 really understand the importance of that sacrifice and how it relates to the defense of American democracy, which is seemingly pretty fragile unexpectedly. So uh, I hope that Mitch McConnell comes back soon. I think he will raise his voice as well. But I think there are a lot of Republicans that are making the, the case that this is a really bad, dangerous direction for the Republican Party to take. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, thank you for being on this morning.